Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Dr Norman Swan. National Cabinet has scrapped mandatory isolation rules for COVID-19 from October 14. We are moving beyond the emergency settings that were put in place. It isn't sustainable for government to pay people's wages forever. It was always envisaged that these measures were emergency measures that were put in place. And what we've done today is take the advice from the Chief Medical Officer, uh, listen to that advice, and, uh, and, and therefore change the settings so that they're proportionate. The decision is not without its controversy. The AMA doesn't like it, and it has been a rough year with many thousands of deaths, despite immunisation and antivirals being available. Experts are predicting a new variant, and the question will be how much it evades existing immunity. And remember, there are far too many Australians who are under-immunised because they still haven't had their third and fourth doses. So the question for politicians is whether they're prepared to reinstate such measures as mandatory isolation should we experience a huge surge in the next weeks and months. Isolation itself cannot be seen in isolation. Uh, it needs to be seen in the context of that high vaccination rate, high previous infection, uh, giving further protection, the availability of treatments, the availability of vaccines, including the, the new uh, bivalent vaccines, uh, and all of the other measures we have in place, particularly to protect vulnerable people close to where they are. It's time to move away from COVID exceptionalism, in my view, uh, and we should be thinking about what we do to protect people from any respiratory disease. It does not mean that we have somehow magically changed the infectiousness of this virus. It is still infectious. Well, let's take a look at kids, because children are generally at low risk of severe COVID-19 disease, but it still can affect every aspect of their lives, from academic performance to physical and mental development, not to mention long COVID. There is good news. The Therapeutic Goods Administration has approved Pfizer's paediatric formulation of its COVID vaccine for children aged between six months and five years. Dr Anthea Rhodes is a paediatrician at Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and she joins us now. Welcome, Anthea. Thanks, Norman. Well, let's start with this vaccine. Some parents are still saying, well, look, why would I bother getting vaccine? They've been told by paediatricians that it's a mild disease, nothing to worry about. Look, absolutely, and it's understandable that parents might find it difficult to, to understand that balance between reassurance that the vaccine is going to be effective and at the same time reassurance that, in fact, the virus itself is mild. But there are a number of reasons why the vaccine still has a really important role here in the overall protection of kids in our community when it comes to COVID-19. There are, of course, a significant proportion of children who will always be more vulnerable, so vaccination is incredibly important for them. We also know that it is conferring some immunity to potentially future infection, even where children have already been infected before. So it's one of the tools in the mix. It's still one of the best tools that we have to protect our children from COVID-19 and what might lie ahead. So for children who are more seriously affected by COVID-19, what are the effects on them? So for Fortunately, very few children, but there are some children who do have more serious effects from COVID-19. Those children who are more vulnerable to serious infection often have underlying conditions that might be of various uh, nature, including things that might affect the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, other developmental problems can also put children at risk. For those children, more severe respiratory illness um, can certainly be a problem and they're the children that we might see, fortunately not frequently, but in hospital. And then of course, there's the very rare but serious complication of what's called multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which we've heard a lot about and that's been the one of the more concerning complications for us as healthcare providers with COVID. Following a COVID infection, some children, very few fortunately, but some children have inflammation of various parts of the body. So different organs, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the brain even can be affected. And we are seeing with the variants as they've evolved that it's more and more rare. So for example, with Omicron, it's 95% less likely to happen than with Alpha. What about long COVID? Long COVID is a really tricky one, Norman. So depending on studies, we see that in children, it might be anywhere from 2 to 8% that are affected so by long COVID. So similar to adults, that's, that's, the, that's what they're quoting for adults. 
In more recent studies, let me finish, there, there's actually been some reviews 12 months on and a really recent study just come out of Germany that suggested in children under 14, so if we take those adolescents out of the picture, that there was no difference a year on between those who had been infected with COVID and those who had not when it came to those non-specific symptoms. So resolution of things that were there um, and suggesting that in children, and particularly younger children, that really long COVID is not the concern that we might have thought it would be. So really reassuring that that's there. But at the same time, we have to remember that the symptoms that we are measuring for long COVID in many instances, like fatigue, um, difficulties with non-specific things, look very similar to some of the effects that might exist as a result of mental health impacts um, and indirect effects of COVID. And that's also incredibly important in children. So the Perhaps really important question here is not so much, you know, is it COVID that's causing some of these really debilitating symptoms in our young people? Um, regardless of the cause, is it direct or indirect effects of the virus? What we need to do is think about what's the need there and what, what we can do to help kids recover. And what about the mental health effects, whether they're direct or indirect? Well, we're learning more and more, you know, as we collect data now coming through the pandemic of those effects. And it's not surprising. And we saw early on some of the more acute impacts, depression and anxiety in children and their parents and those things being related to one another and also definitely related to lockdown and experiences um, that meant children were you know, removed from all those things in their lives that we know contribute to their well-being. School and early learning environments being, you know, the really big and obvious one, but socialisation, sporting, um, you know, outlets, all kinds of other things that we know children need to grow and thrive. So data that's coming out is very clear that the impacts have been significant. But of course, the big question is, you know, which children are still struggling and what are they going to need to actually, you know, recover from the really significant impacts when it comes to their mental health and wellbeing. Anthea Rhodes, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Norman. Here to talk about the impact of COVID on children's learning is Professor Jim Waterston, who is from the Melbourne Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Jim. Uh, nice to be here, Norman. Give us, you know, a helicopter view of what, you, what you're finding, because Melbourne was the epicentre, really, with so many lockdowns uh, and probably the most, and the most seriously affected city. Yes, that's correct. And uh, as we're all aware, it was uh, almost 250 days of lockdown during the pandemic. And so it did um, hit students uh, quite hard in, in this state in particular. But there were um, lesser days uh, across all Australian states. What, what we've found in doing a number of studies right around Australia is that uh, when teachers had to um, valiantly transition to uh, or, or from a face-to-face -face learning situation to, um, to an online external environment, um, that about 20% at least of all uh, students from uh, uh, early childhood right through to uh, year 12 weren't able to connect uh, in, the, in the sense that they were able to continue learning uh, activities and so uh, a number of uh, young people um, were very destabilised during that period of time. Uh, and, what what and do you mean when you say destabilised? I mean, and, and not able to connect. They're, they're, they didn't have a computer at home. Um, what, 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 just give us a flavour of the circumstances there. Sure. So, so there was a range of different circumstances, but in general, it was um, a number of students weren't able to use the technology to be able to log in. Uh, and so uh, in, in terms of um, disadvantaged uh, fam uh, areas and, and, and families who didn't have a, a laptop or, or a computer to use, schools um, provided them, but it was really difficult for people who weren't familiar with the technology to be able to um, come, in, come in each day and, and provide uh, the instruction and, and work as they would have uh, had they uh, not been part of COVID. So uh, that was one instance. There were also other instances where um, the pedagogy, the way people teach um, was was really challenging because it, students um, having been in class, uh, you know, for, for a number of years are used to being um, teacher directed. And so having to work with some form of independence at home uh, was a real struggle and, and, and not having that constant support. So depending on the on the, the, the facilities and the support that was provided in the home, then um, young people had varying success 
or, or otherwise in terms of being able to continue their learning. And the mental health effects? We're talking about that with Anthea Rhodes. Yes, me mental health is something that's been amplified uh, during COVID. There was certainly uh, a greater prevalence of mental health in young people and also teachers, by the way. But uh, but but we, we knew this before um, COVID, uh, that, that mental health issues certainly have a major impact on uh, learning capability and success. And so um, this amplification during COVID uh, has shown that um, from a teacher's role, it's not just about um, making sure that the instruction is uh, fluent and, and able to be absorbed, but it's also about uh, making sure that the conditions for learning are in place. So, and so, teachers, sorry, yes. What about recovery? I mean, the, uh, we've had, uh, I think, a round of NAPLAN since people have gone back, since students have gone back to school. Are, we, are, we, are kids still who were not doing well, the 20% or so who uh, were failing to connect and there presumably was a, another percentage who were underperforming, which we haven't talked about. Um, what's, the, what's happening with recovery? Are we seeing lower NAPLANs? Uh, are, are kids coming back to normal? Kids are pretty resilient. They are, and, and the NAP plan would show that they have been resilient. So in Victoria in particular, uh, the NAP plan results were, were standardised, I, I guess, in, from previous years. And so we, we didn't see a, a massive change uh, that we can sort of focus uh, that being on COVID, but, but we really still um, are concerned about the long term. And so um, for, for some of those students that we talked about, the 20%, um, uh, Learning has has been challenged, and and we'll have to see over time. Some but parents course, are saying. Some parents are saying, well, the kids don't want to go back to school. They're still not engaged in learning. They are traumatized. What adv I mean, are schools responding to this? And what advice can you give such parents? Yes. So, so that there's a range of of reactions. So that there were some students who perhaps hadn't been suited by being in a, in a school before and um, uh, had, had felt bullied or, or perhaps not well accepted uh, within that environment. So, so they, they um, thrive when they're at home and, and a number of those students don't want to go back because they've really appreciated the opportunities that come with online learning. But of course, the majority of students um, were desperate to come back and, and that socialisation, which is uh, a, a major core of, of, of what a school uh, school's value proposition is, is something that, uh, especially in Victoria, students missed. And, and uh, you know, we can only suppose that that contributed significantly to the mental health issues. Jim, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. And that's the show for this week. Join us every Friday at this time. I'm Norman Swan. Bye for now.